Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our Totem Top 10 series. Uh, huge thank you to the Ohio SBDC for allowing us, Totem Technologies, the opportunity to come in and, and present this to you all. Uh, I've had an awesome time so far uh, walking us through the first several weeks, and um, we're actually now following on to the second half of this series, so looking forward to what's going to come down the stretch but we have had a uh, fun time so far. We've talked about a lot. And so looking forward to uh, today's discussion in particular. Um, before we dive into the presentation, I did just want to say that, um, you know, just with all the craziness sort of that's been going on in the world uh, the last week, specifically, we see the, the crisis occurring in Ukraine. Um, it has caused a lot of people uh, to begin wondering, you know, what what sorts of things they should be doing uh, to to bolster their business of cybersecurity because uh, they worry. They worry about uh, foreign threats, and they worry that they may not have the the adequate safeguards in place to be able to uh, protect themselves against these. And we don't know ultimately how all of this is going to play out, uh, but we do know that. Um, we, what we can do is we can be looking for ways to, to protect ourselves and to protect our businesses from, from cyber threats. And obviously panicking probably isn't the best way to respond. Um, so let's just get to work and focus on, on the things that we can do to, uh, to lower our cybersecurity risk. And this ultimately is why uh, this series exists. It's because we want to assist you in doing that and bring you the most important information that we feel um, should be implemented right away. And so that's sort of the basis for our Totem Top 10 series. Uh, we are discussing 10 specific cybersecurity safeguards uh, that we recommend you put in place to lower your, your risk. And uh, so far we've covered four out of the 10. Today we are going to be looking at our fifth control which is to restrict administrative privileges. Uh, during the course of the session today, we're going to talk about, well, what is, uh, or what are rather administrative privileges? What, what do these mean in the context of your network, your computer, the information that you handle and the capabilities that you have? Uh, we're gonna discuss why administrative privileges are actually dangerous and why they should be tightly controlled uh, within your environment. And we're gonna be discussing some options that you can put in place right away, actually, and for little to no cost at all to begin uh, remediating this. So I'm gonna be demoing for you all uh, how you can uh, restrict administrative privileges uh, in a Windows environment. And I will also be pointing you to other resources that you can do to do the same. And the tools that we will use to do this is I'll be demoing uh, Windows user account control, which is basically uh, the account control functionality built into Windows operating systems. It's really, really nice and really, really simple. And as always, as we continue to chug along, we refer to our system inventory as being our uh, sort of number one resource to guide us along this entire process. It is something we've been referring to every week on a weekly basis, and that isn't going to stop today. So be sure to go grab a, a copy of your system inventory, system inventory template on our free tools page. If you haven't already, this is where you can go get it. You'll find it's just the uh, system inventory template there on that page. Fun stuff. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, obviously welcome. It's good to have you here. And a uh, little introduction. My name is Nathan. I am a cybersecurity engineer with Totem Technologies. And my contact information is there for you if you want to get in touch with me. As always, a, a quick review before we jump into the new material. Um, a super common theme that we have seen over and over again is that small businesses are indeed prime targets for hackers. Uh, and this is for a number of reasons. 
we've seen that as a whole, we tend to be too overconfident in our cybersecurity, meaning that we are uh, assuming that we are more secure than we actually are, when in reality, we may be relying on old methods or old technology to protect us. And these, uh, these things are easily exploitable. And so we can't depend on them to, to protect us. In addition to this, we've noticed that also our users, uh, those who are handling our company sensitive information on a daily basis are not trained to be able to identify and prevent even basic cybersecurity threats, also making us more vulnerable. And uh, all of these things together make us a prime target for hackers. Uh, we have debunked the myth that hackers don't care about small businesses. It's actually because we are so unsecure, because we are so vulnerable, that makes us easy pickings, so to speak, for, uh, for the bad guys. And so uh, we should really get away from the mindset that, oh, the, the hackers only care about the big businesses. That's not true. Small businesses are attacked regularly, and we are seeing the number of attacks on small businesses going up and up and up and up on a regular basis. So because of this, we need a plan. We need something, uh, some strategy in place to be able to help us get this under control. And uh, the, the approach that we are recommending to you through this series is a defense in depth approach, meaning that uh, instead of having just one or two really effective controls in place, we want to we want to layer as many together as we possibly can, where if one of the safeguards were to fail in, in preventing an attack, another one can step in and take its place. And so each control that we've discussed so far, and each control that we will discuss, we recommend that you include as part of your defense in depth strategy. And sort of to uh, measure the effectiveness of this strategy during this series, uh, in, in session zero, technically, our first week together, I presented to you all a, a real phishing email that we received and we analyzed, okay, what would have happened if a user had clicked on this invoice.doc attachment in this phishing email? And so we analyzed all the nastiness that came with that. And now we turn our attention to, okay, what sorts of things can we do to prevent this phishing attack from being successful? And that's what we've looked at on a weekly basis with each control, just to sort of put that control in context of an actual uh, situation that you will be faced with regularly as phishing is the number one threat facing all businesses of all sizes. So we need a plan to uh, mitigate that risk of a phishing attack being successful. So we will revisit this today, of course, as we talk about restricting administrative privileges. And last week, we introduced our second technology of the series, which was to patch software and operating systems. We looked at how running old and outdated systems, operating systems, whatever, is a huge cybersecurity risk because uh, hackers will actually go around and uh, look for outdated technology running on your network. And at that point, since it's outdated, they already know what vulnerabilities exist within it. And so their ability to exploit it is significantly increased. And so by implementing a routine patching implementation strategy, uh, you can help to reduce the risk of an attacker compromising your sensitive information through that avenue. And we also discussed why a routine patching plan should be complemented by a, um, a routine vulnerability scan, meaning that once you've updated your systems, once you've implemented the patches, that you should follow up these patches with a, uh, a scan to ensure that the patches actually took, that the vulnerabilities that were ident <clears throat> excuse me, identified before the patch are no longer there. And so these two things working together uh, can help add to your defense in depth strategy. 
So that's what we discussed last week. And this is where we stand so far in our series. As I mentioned, we have covered the first four controls. Know your assets, train your users, whitelist software, and patch software and operating systems. Uh, I hope that you are beginning to see how you can implement these controls in your own environment and also how these controls work together actually to create a, uh, a robust cybersecurity program. These aren't mutually exclusive. So we do encourage you to, to uh, implement all of them if you can. And I hope you're also noticing that none of these are particularly difficult to implement um, or even expensive. They, uh, they just take a little bit of time, a little bit of strategy. So hope you're finding some value so far in this series and uh, would love to hear your feedback on if you have already started implementing any of these or if you have any questions on how you can do that. Well, let's go ahead and jump in. I figured before we talk about why we should restrict administrative privileges that we should probably explore what they even are. And uh, the most basic way that I can define administrative privileges are they are essentially a, uh, a set of permissions or capabilities within a given system that essentially allow a user or multiple users to make major changes to that system. For example, administrative privileges could be used to, uh, to change how an operating system is configured, um, what software or applications are allowed to run or be installed in that system, uh, which files are allowed to be accessed, even maybe which user accounts exist within that system. And so lots of different abilities come with having administrative privileges. And uh, the most important point here is while, well, it's just the difference between an administrative account and a, a basic user account. A basic user account is limited in what it can do. It does not have the capability to make major changes to a system like the things I previously mentioned. On the other hand, administrative accounts do not have any limitations. They essentially have free range over a given system that the account is on and they can essentially alter it however they want to. Um, if you are running Windows, you may have seen this image here on the right. This is uh, the administrative privileges logo actually. And this, this image you'll see next to some process or something you wanna run. Um, this indicates that administrative privileges are required to run that particular task or service. If you haven't seen that before, I'll point it out here in a minute when we do our demonstration. But um, in Windows environments, this is the, the logo to be familiar with when it comes to admin privileges. Uh, depending on the operating system you're running, you may also hear different terms for these administrative accounts. You may hear them referred to as privileged accounts, possibly root accounts, R-O-O-T, or maybe even super user accounts. These all essentially mean the same thing. And any user that has one of these accounts essentially has control over that system. They can make essentially whatever changes to that system that they want to. And so hopefully you can start to see or start to think about the implications of operating with a control with these capabilities. Um, think about it in the context of maybe a, a hacker. Um, if a hacker were to target your network and successfully breach your network, one of the first things that they are going to do is they're going to check which account they have successfully compromised. And if it is not an administrator, they are going to begin to execute what is known as privilege escalation, which essentially just means trying, they're trying to move from their current standard user account to a privileged administrator account 
because they know that that account is what's going to give them control over that system and allow them to make whatever changes that they are wanting to do. And so hackers want these accounts, administrator accounts are, are uh, prized possessions of them, they're highly sought after. And so this means that we need to do something to prevent them from getting them. So, well, the problem with this is that um, it usually is pretty easy uh, to compromise these accounts specifically because default accounts are actually administrators. Meaning that uh, when you break open a machine for the first time and you create an account, that account is an administrator by default. And the real issue is that once that account is created and the user signs on, nothing is done to, to manage this upon creating the account. And like people just set it up and forget about it, or they don't even notice, which is probably more likely the case. But this means that your basic users, or at least employees who don't need administrative privileges to perform their job, are operating with these privileges on a daily basis. And although we, we want to assume that they're not, you know, doing anything malicious with these, with these privileges, uh, it is a seriously bad idea to, to leave it like this. Because essentially, sort of the flow here, when you are operating as an administrator, everything that you are doing is executed with administrative level permissions. And this includes if you were to click on some malware through a phishing link that is emailed to you. If you click on that link, if I clicked on that invoice.doc, as an administrator, that malware inside gets executed with administrative privileges. And so essentially by doing that, by operating with my administrator account and clicking on a phishing link or, or a bad URL on some website or whatever, I'm essentially authorizing that piece of malware to to carry out its intended task however it wants to, because I am the administrator and what I say happens, happens. And so just by clicking on it, I've given it my permission to do whatever it wants to, even if I have no clue what its intended purpose is. And so uh, these accounts have virtually unlimited access to all programs, they can make whatever changes they want to. And so the malware, the, the, uh, the attack or whatever it is, would be able to do the same. And so this ultimately is why hackers are after administrative privileges, because without them, their attacks are more likely to not be successful. I can't say they won't be successful, but they're more likely to not be because in most cases, they need the administrative privileges to make the sort of changes they want to a given system. For the, take the example of, you know, putting some, some uh, ransomware in a system. You need an administrator account to uh, be able to make it to the location that you're after and, um, embed the ransomware in such a way that it can affect multiple users and begin to spread on its own as well and make the changes to the system that it needs to, to begin encrypting files and information and everything. And so without administrative privileges, it's far more difficult to actually achieve that. In fact, on the right here, you see uh, the accounts page in uh, Windows settings. And as you can see, this particular user uh, is running as an administrator. You can see down there. And uh, he is, so he has administrative privileges on his local machine. I would strongly recommend that uh, you go check this right now if you are on your workstation, on your work computer, and just see what type of account you're running with. Um, if you are on your your work machine and you are running as an administrator, I would 
caution you that uh, this is this is not good, and this is something that you should immediately look to remediate. And I will uh, show you the steps for remediating this here in a moment. But uh, you can just go to your Windows settings, the, the gear icon, and go to account. And underneath your name, you'll you will see either administrator or it will be blank. If it does not say administrator, you are not running as an, as an admin. So definitely go check that right now. Back to our phishing example. Uh, I wanted to bring our uh, notorious email to light again and just highlight how administrative privileges were involved in this attack. And for those of us who couldn't join us on day one, as you can see, this, this phishing email, again, one that we actually received, uh, contains an attachment, an invoice.doc. And essentially, when a user clicks on this document, uh, it activates some malware, some malicious code embedded deep inside the Word document, which then forces the, the machine that uh, the user's running on that clicked on the on the attachment it forces that machine to reach out to an external file server and actually retrieve and install a key logger on the machine, which is a uh, basically a program that monitors everything you're typing and then forwards it to a an external destination to a remote hacker essentially so they can harvest all your information. And so it was a super duper ugly attack. And I demonstrated during session zero, one particular tool for analyzing a malicious file called any.run. Pull that up again. Any.runs, you can see here, this is what it looks like. And I'd like to just revisit this briefly to show you guys how administrative privileges were involved with this attack. So this is, this is what the interface looks like. Essentially what we did is we uploaded the invoice.doc attachment to this. It's a virtual sandbox testing environment. And what this will do is it will execute whatever attachment you uploaded and basically just see what happens. In fact, let me put the link in the chat here. It is a free, free tool. At least the basic version that I'm using now is free. And so if for any reason you need to do some, do a little more investigating with an attachment or something that you receive, this is a great environment to do it in. But anyways, so we uploaded the file and any.run will execute it. And we will see how it affects the, the victim Windows 7 machine. As you can see, this, this here is a Windows 7 machine. There's lots of information here. But as you can see, uh, everything that is occurring here is under the username admin. And we know that this account, like this is the name that's just been assigned to the account. We don't know just from the name of the user that that is actually an administrator account, but we do know that this account is actually an administrator because of all of the all of the changes that are made uh, to this to this system as a result of clicking on this Word document. For example, um, we see in the text report here one of the things I pointed out in session zero is that this, by clicking on this Word document, nearly 2,000 changes were made to the, to the registry, to the, the brain of this computer. And in order to make these changes, it does require administrative privileges. A basic user cannot make a lot of these uh, significant registry key edits in some cases, new keys were created that essentially would dictate how the machine would operate. So lots and lots and lots and lots of changes were made that required administrative privileges. 
And so without these privileges, the attacker would not have been able to, to make these changes. They would have had to go through that privilege escalation technique that I mentioned a moment ago and try to get a hold of one of these accounts because without it, they would not have been able to, to make these changes. So for example, what might have happened is they would have, they may have gotten the user to click on the Word document and we'll say the Word document was, was indeed vulnerable uh, to that exploit that we talked about in the equation editor in Microsoft Word. And so it would trigger that, it would trigger a command prompt to open. So you can see just in the process here, the user clicks on the Word document, uh, it triggers Excel, it, it, tr it triggers the equation editor executable, and then it triggers a command prompt. This is where it would have ended because the command prompt, I think I can, I think it shows in the images here actually. Yep. In the command prompt, as you can see there at the top of it, it says C and then a colon and backslash Windows slash system 32. That tells me that command prompt has been run as an administrator. In order to do that, you have to be an administrator. And so this attack likely would have stopped right here because the, the, the attacker would not have been able to run the commands that it wished to run, which would have then reached out to that external file server and pulled back that uh, malicious executable, which then installed the keylogger. So it's very likely that this attack would have stopped right here if the Windows 7 machine user was not running an administrator account. If they're running just a basic user account, the, uh, the attacker likely would not have been able to successfully run command prompt and essentially pivot to what they were targeting. So bad news for the victim if, you're, if he or she was running with administrator privileges, good news if they were not. And that's honestly the, the reality, like just cybersecurity as a whole, you know, we're trying to mitigate risk. At some point, one of your users is going to click on a phishing email. It's just, it's going to happen. So what sort of things do we have in place that are going to protect us when that does inevitably happen? Well, in this case, the user clicked on it and it got nowhere. If thinking back to last week, if the user had patched their system, the uh, Microsoft Word application would not have been vulnerable to this exploit. And so it would have stopped even before the command prompt tried to open. So hopefully you can see that with these two working together, then we're, we're looking pretty good. And then you throw whitelisting on top of that, that like we talked about two weeks ago, and we have essentially created a, a, uh, a relatively secure system. And so we have multiple layers working together to try and prevent this attack from being successful. Defense in depth for the win. But yeah, give, give any.run a, a visit at some point if you'd like, and I'd be happy to show you more about how this, this guy works, but it's a really useful tool, honestly just for digging a little deeper because you are gonna get some strange emails at some point. So it's good to know what you're looking at. So we talked a lot about how big of an issue administrative privileges are. I hope I've made that clear and I hope uh, you're starting to think that steps should be taken within your organization to, uh, to mitigate these and to uh, take these away from from your users and these are the uh, the options that we are going to recommend for you when it comes to uh, remediating these risks and uh, first we 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 know that uh, your users do not be do not need to be signed into uh, full-time administrator accounts it's just not necessary. A, a basic user account will do because most of them aren't 
you know, aren't needing to make changes to, to an operating system. They aren't needing to make changes. They aren't needing to run command prompt with administrator privileges. They're just, they're accessing the internet. They're using Microsoft Word, Excel, you know, so basic privileges will suffice for them to be able to perform their job and to perform it well, right? And so what we recommend is that you create a standard user account for every single member of your organization for everyday use. And yes, this actually even includes your IT staff, your IT administrators and, and, and everyone on their team. And they will get access to their administrative privileges another way, which I'll show during the demo. But everyone should be operating on a daily basis with a standard user account. They don't need to be running with an administrator account because of the risks that I highlighted earlier in the event that someone were to be running full time with one of these accounts and they actually clicked on a phishing link or something else super ugly, it's gonna get real bad real fast. And so everyone must have a basic user account. It is especially important that also your executives are not running with administrative rights because as we've seen, they are the targets of more sophisticated and more well-crafted attacks. And so hackers are essentially seeking out these individuals and targeting them specifically. They're putting together very creative, very, very just well-crafted attacks and sending them their way. And so um, hackers essentially want, they want influence within a, within a company. They want access to the most important resources. And typically these permissions, uh, permissions to access these have been given to executives. And so we can mitigate this risk by just simply removing their access to privileged accounts and just like everyone else, giving them a standard user account. One widely adopted principle that you may have heard before is the principle of least privilege, which essentially states that a given user should only have the minimum permissions required to perform his or her, his or her job. And although this is a, a really good principle in theory, it does become more difficult for small businesses to put into practice because honestly, in reality, we all wear multiple hats. We have many different responsibilities. And so it's, it, it's a good principle to keep in mind and to try to implement where possible. But what I would recommend is um, in addition to trying to implement this is to utilize your system inventory just to stay on top of, of what permissions your users have, what access to certain systems they may have, and to just keep all of these things well documented and well tracked over time, especially as changes are introduced to your system as new employees are added or removed, you need to stay on top of these things. And so if you have not yet downloaded our system inventory spreadsheet, you can do that on our free tools page that I mentioned would highly, highly encourage you to do that. But anyways, um, with this in mind, let's turn our attention to uh, what tool we are going to use to actually enforce these permission restrictions. I hope you see just during this series, we, we talked about two important things. Each control is sort of twofold. There's sort of the policy side, and then there's the implementation or the enforcement side. And so, yeah writing down that we want to use the principle of least privilege or rather that our users should not be operating with administrator accounts, you know, writing that out is good, necessary because we need it to train our users, but we need technology to come alongside it and actually enforce those policies. And so there are plenty of tools out there for use for centralized account management meaning managing all of your user accounts in one place and the permissions associated with those accounts. For example, you may consider Microsoft Active Directory, 
which is the centralized account management tool for Windows domains. We use Active Directory here at Totem. Uh, another really handy feature that we are going to recommend that you implement is called user account control, which is another tool that will give you control over what software, what processes your users are running. And so for specific uh, administrator only processes, it is going to require your users to actually authenticate themselves. Meaning that if I were to, if Windows user account control were fully engaged as it is here on the, on the, uh, on the slide, if it were to be fully engaged by my administrator and I'm just a basic user, if I were to go try and run say Windows PowerShell as an administrator, it's going to ask me, well, what are your administrator credentials? I don't have administrator credentials, so I can't run the task. And I'm going to demo this here in a minute, but Windows user account is a, a really, really handy feature. We use it here at Totem as well, and it's baked into Windows, so it's pretty easy to implement. Uh, I doubt we have many Linux users in, in, uh, in this group, but if you are a Linux user, first virtual fist bump, because I do like Linux as well. But we just recommend you probably, you should not be operating with uh, root privileges regularly. Uh, if you have other users that have access to these, just limit these as well. I'm not gonna go into depth with Linux, but uh, these, I guess more the point is these, uh, these recommendations apply across multiple operating systems. The vast majority of the market share is Windows. And so we are making our recommendations based on Windows, but um, these apply across different OSs as well. So if you wanna learn more about how to li limit user permissions in Linux, just let me know, I'd be happy to show you. Uh, let's go ahead and transition now from slides and whatnot to our demonstration. Uh, I would like to show you how we can leverage both day-to-day -day user accounts as well as the user account control feature that I mentioned a moment ago uh, to make it really challenging for adversaries to do anything if they were to successfully get a hold of one of your users' accounts. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this guy up. Are there any questions as I transition here? Feel free to type questions in the chat if you have any. <clears throat> I'm working in VMware Workstation. It's going to restore the virtual state. This will take a second. I'm working in uh, VMware Workstation, which is a really handy tool for your IT staff, for engineers to be able to uh, test out <clears throat> different operating systems or different programs or whatever in a virtual environment. So this is completely isolated. Um, if you were to inquire about purchasing maybe a new software and you wanted to see how it worked, you could fire up a virtual machine and test it out. That's what we do. And uh, it also allows you to just sort of dig into the guts of of an operating system of a piece of software program or whatever and see how it really works. This is a Windows 10 machine. And as you can see here, there are two accounts on this machine. I have an administrator and I have a standard user. Uh, the administrator account would be the default account that is created when I first set this up. In fact, it was and I just renamed it to admin. So this is indeed administrator. I then went in and created a separate user account, a basic user account, and I named it user. Uh, we're just gonna be working in the administrator account, but I will show, I'll show you how to create a separate user account, at least in a, a local, on a local machine. Sign in here. Here we are, I'm on my desktop. 
real quick before we jump in. If I wanted to create a separate user account, all I'd have to do is go to control panel. You guys can see that. Okay, actually, let's that. Let's do the, uh, this guy. This guy, and then geez, it's kind of stretched. Yeah, sorry, you may have to squint a little bit. Let's go into the control panel, and then we'll go to user accounts. User accounts again. There's that symbol I mentioned. So this is the symbol for administrative rights, meaning that if you are not an administrator, you will need to, you won't be able to run this. In fact, on a standard user account, you won't even see these options. So as you can see, I have my administrator account here named admin. It is indeed an administrator. If I wanted to manage another account, if I wanted to create another one, I just come to manage accounts and then I can add a new user here. So as you can see, I have a basic user they, that is not an administrator. So that's the environment that we're working with here. Now, an administrator can do essentially whatever I want. If I wanted to say I'll run command prompt, I can run it as an administrator. Okay. And there's that C. Uh, colon backslash windows slash system 32 like I pointed out in the any dot run if you were running command prompt as a basic user you will see your username instead of windows or at least the username that you are signed into so this tells me that we are running this as an administrator and I can make really whatever changes I want to for example so I want, wanted to see who all is in my administrator group. Looks like it's just me, it's just admin. But if I wanted to, if there were other users in here, I could, I could remove them. There is so much I could do in here to really change everything about how this machine works inside of this. Uh, but I won't. <laughs> I won't make you guys suffer through watching that. So that's one example of what I could do. If I wanted to get into the guts of this machine, I could go into the registry. Remember when I pointed out on any.run that if you clicked on that invoice.doc attachment, in the end, it would, it would make two, almost 2,000 changes to the, uh, to the operating system, to the registry. This is where an adversary could do that. And a basic user can, unless an administrator has restricted them access to it, they can access the registry editor, but they cannot make any changes to it. So for example, if I wanted to just create a new key here, I am an administrator and so I have the ability to do that. Of course, it's a live demonstration, so it won't work. <laughs> Just like that. So I could create a new key. I can name it whatever I want and I could add values to it, whatever values that I want. And so I could do a lot of damage with this. So in the end, with that attack, nearly 2000 changes were made uh, to the machine, whether that be editing current registry keys or adding new ones or deleting already existing ones. This is where um, an adversary would likely come to to maintain control over a given system and ensure that whatever changes they made stay in place. Go ahead and get rid of this key. Yes. So we need some sort of control over what our users can access. Um, and administrator so we know that we we don't want our administrators running full-time on admin accounts but what exactly do we do well i had mentioned a tool called user account control and you can just search uac on your own machine to pull this up if you'd like and you'll see change user account control settings that's where we want to be and this is what it looks like as you can see the user account control feature is down all the way. 
meaning that I am never notified when apps try to install software or make changes to my computer, or I make any changes to Windows settings, <laughs> and it's not recommended. So like I said, when I tried to run, run command prompt as an administrator, nothing stopped me. It just fired right up. And so we don't want this. This is not good. So let's see what happens when we enable this all the way. And I try to do the same thing. Again, I'm still signed into an administrator account. I get this. I get this friendly box that asks me, do you want to allow this app to make changes to your device? I'm like, well, yeah, sure. And then it fires up command prompt. So, okay, there's an additional notification, an additional checkbox I have to click, but it's still super easy. Like this doesn't really solve the problem because we are still running as an administrator. And if I were to still click on a phishing link while running this account, the hacker's not gonna, not gonna be stopped by that box, right? It's like, oh, yes, <laughs> of course. So running as an administrator full-time, even with user account control is not, is not the answer. This is why we need a separate user account, like I mentioned, which you can do in control panel, or if your company is util utilizing Active Directory, your IT staff will go into there and create a user account for you and assign you access to that. Now, let me show you. So we have user account control fully engaged, which means that this will apply to our user account as well. So I'd like to show you what impact this has on a standard user. So let's go ahead and go sign in. To our basic user account. Here we are. I'll show you that I am indeed not an administrator. Settings, I need to be in accounts. Just a user, not an administrator. So I can't make any significant changes. Look what happens when I try to do the same thing. I try to run a command prompt as an administrator or essentially what would have happened for the attacker when they tried to execute that, uh, that command prompt after clicking the phishing link. I got a command prompt and I wanna run this guy as administrator. I get this box. Do you want to allow this app to make changes to your device to continue enter an admin username and password? If I am a local user, I don't know what these credentials are and I shouldn't know what these are. These credentials would be reserved for, honestly, probably only your IT administrator, maybe not even your other IT staff, maybe just your, your admin and that is it. Um, keep in mind the principle of least privileges. Like if, does who at the end should be the one authorizing uh, unknown or, uh, yeah, just unknown processes to be run. Well, it would have to be your IT administrator um, because he or she is in control of, or should be in control of everything that is allowed to run on your network. And so as a basic user, I should not be able to, to make any changes to do anything aside from what has been granted permission to me to do. And so I could try and type in my credentials doesn't work. But let's now say that, um, so we'll transition from a user who, who is not IT staff will say this person was, was a marketing employee, probably doesn't need administrative privileges. Now let's say I am, I am the IT administrator and I want to install a new piece of software or something, right? We'll say I want to run command prompts to 
to do some perform some various tasks. We'll do the same thing. I'll fire up command prompt and I'll run it as administrator. But in this case, I have the credentials to make it work. And so I can just enter them in. And I get my command prompt. So I've I am not running with an administrator account on a full-time basis. I'm still running with a basic user, but I am still able to perform the tasks I need to, to perform my job, right? And so when you combine standard user accounts for all of your users with the technology of user account control, um, you actually get a, a really, well protected, really uh, well defended, in my opinion, environment. That is the result. And so hopefully you can see the implications here. That wasn't difficult to implement. Um, in fact, it just it makes things really easy to manage across the board because this way, it, like your, your users won't be able to go and install unknown pieces of software. If they wanted something new to be added, they would need to approach their IT administrator who could then look into the product, uh, run a security impact analysis on that. And then collectively uh, as an organization, they can make the decision whether or not to accept that piece of software or whatever, add it to their baseline, whitelist it, and then users can access it. So really, really handy feature. This is something that we have in full force here at Totem. And uh, it's a really robust technology actually. And no doubt it has kept us safe from a lot of potentially unwanted programs being installed or, uh, or malware or anything because we have had users click on phishing links because it just happens. But thankfully, we have other controls in place in our defense and depth strategy to step in and assist us. So that's the demo. Hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have any questions about user account control or I had mentioned uh, Active Directory, it's more likely that this these things aren't going to be implemented in a local environment. That's just all I'm able to show you because I'm using a virtual machine here and I'm not connected to any actual domain. So if you want some tips and tricks on how to implement this on a, uh, or for a group, happy to give you some further information on that. Well, I see that we are about out of time. Uh, by this point, um, we have, not everything in place that we want to, but we are really, really giving ourselves a lot of help. If we have implemented every control up to this point, if we have, uh, if we know our assets, if we've created our system inventory, if we have trained our users to be able to identify and uh, prevent cyber threats and to help build a cybersecurity culture within our organization, if we are whitelisting software, if we are controlling exactly what software we want to allow to run in our environment, if we are patching our software and our operating systems, and if we are restricting administrative privileges, each of these things, not, not super difficult to implement, we are off to a really, really good start. And uh, you, are, you are well on your way, for sure. And so this is the essentially the halfway point in our totem top 10. And so we do have five more controls that we are going to recommend, but this is, we understand that this is a race. It's not a sprint. It's unrealistic to put all of these in place at one time. We get that. So hopefully you're, you're taking the time just to sort of absorb these ideas and think about how they could be implemented in your environment. So. Would love to hear any questions, comments, concerns, or anything else as we wrap up our session for today. Any questions?
Well, as always, feel free to get in touch with me if you do have any questions, and I'd be more than happy to uh, answer those for you. So thanks all for tuning in, and we shall catch you next week.